All right, well, good morning. Um, I want you to go ahead and open up to the Gospel of John, chapter 6. We're going to continue our journey uh, through the Gospel. All right, John chapter 6, and we're going to be in uh, verses 22 down to uh, 36 today. And we're going to be looking at how Jesus um, is the bread of life, okay? How Jesus is the bread of life. And in the course of this conversation, as Jesus reveals himself um, to be uh, this bread of life, we're going to find out the root motivation behind why this huge crowd has been following Jesus. And I want us to be thinking about as we take our journey through the end of this chapter, uh, we'll revisit this multiple times. Why why are you following Jesus? Um, Are you following Him uh, because it's what you want Him to do for you? Or are you following Him because you love Him for who He is? Now, as you uh, start out here in John chapter 6, if you go back to verse 2, Uh, We see here Jesus at the height of his popularity, of his public ministry. He's never going to be more popular than he is right here in John chapter 6. And it tells you about this crowd that's following him. And it says, A huge crowd kept following Jesus wherever he went because they saw his miraculous signs as he healed the sick. Right? They see what Jesus can do and they're following him. Now, If you know John chapter 6, what's the first thing that he does here in the chapter? He does this huge miracle that's in all four Gospels. It's what? He feeds the 5,000. How does he feed feed the 5,000? What does he do? What's he do? Yeah, he, he produces bread out of thin air. Okay? To feed 5,000. He takes this little boy's lunch. And the boy's lunch is not the significant part. There happens to be five tiny little wheat thins in there, basically, right? And he expands that to feed a crowd of 5,000 men plus women and children, right? That's the backdrop for what's going on. Okay, so then the crowd is dismissed. Jesus stays behind to dismiss the crowd. Jesus sends the disciples out onto the Sea of Galilee. And what happens on the sea? We talked about it last week. What happens? There's a huge storm that comes up. Right, And in the process of this huge storm, what does Jesus decide to do and what does he want to reveal about himself to the disciples? Yeah, he walks on the water. And why does he walk on the water? What is he trying to reveal about himself? Yeah, he's I am. He's the creator. He's God in the flesh. He's revealing his divinity to them. Now, we're going to leave the disciples, although the disciples are are still present, And we're going to pick it up in verse 22. And this is the morning after the feeding of the 5,000. And we're going to revisit the crowd. Why is the crowd following Jesus as opposed to what's going on with the disciples? All right, John chapter 6, verse 22. We begin and it says, On the next day, the crowd that remained on the other side of the sea saw that there there had only been one boat there and that Jesus had not entered the boat with his disciples but his disciples had gone away alone now again the time frame of this passage of scripture is really important it occurs the next day the next morning after the feeding of the 5000 also uh, John mentions something else he says what side of the lake they remained on and he says they remained on the other side of the Sea of Galilee. And the other side, uh, not always, but most of the time in Scripture, when referencing the Sea of Galilee in the Gospels, is speaking about the eastern shore of the Sea of Galilee, and it's the Gentile side of the shore. Uh, Notice how the disciples, what has Jesus done with the disciples? He sent them on ahead, and they've crossed over. Right? They've left the eastern shore, the Gentile side, and they've crossed over into the promised land. Now, I believe it's an indirect reference to the Israelites that while they wandered in the wilderness with Moses. 
uh, while they wandered in the wilderness with Moses, the crowd of Israelites, uh, they were consistently unruly and unbelieving. It didn't matter how much the Lord did for them, how much He provided, it was never enough. Ever. They refused to cross the Jordan, the river which feeds the Sea of Galilee, and enter into the promised land. Okay. However, God says He does away with one whole generation of them, and He says, I'll bring in your kids, I'll bring in the next generation, or I'll bring in a remnant of the people that originally left. Now, the disciples are a representation of this remnant, right? There's 12 disciples. How many tribes were there in Israel, if you're familiar? How many? Yeah, there's 12, right? He sends them on over, and they follow at Christ's command, and they, they cross. Now, the next morning, after this miracle happened, and remember, it happened at dinner time. it's now the next meal. It's meal time again. Okay? And what is the crowd? Hungry. So they awoke in the morning. They found their meal ticket and their free entertainment had departed. Okay? Now, to our shame, to our shame, to my shame, we should admit this tendency as well. It's really easy to follow Jesus when Jesus drops blessings into our lap straight from the sky. When God is doing everything we want, it's really easy to follow Him. But we'll discover here in this final section here in John 6 that this is the main motivation behind their curiosity with Christ. It's all about what Jesus can do for them, not who He is. Now, also, Jesus is super popular at this point. And still today in our culture, if you are super popular or famous, people want to kind of ride on your coattails, right? They want to be associated with you because you're famous, right? They would like you to endorse their product, right? But they don't care about you so much. They just care about what you can do for them. Now, even though their motivations were wrong, though, the basic principle behind their actions are not. They awake in the morning, they find Jesus is gone, and they go looking for him. Well, kudos for that part. They went looking for Jesus, right? They wanted to be wherever Jesus was, even if it was for the wrong motivation. All right, verse 23 through 24, it says, Other boats from Tiberias came near the place where they had eaten the bread, which we know was by Bethsaida, after the Lord had given thanks. So when the crowd saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they themselves got into boats, and they went to Capernaum seeking Jesus. Now, the boats that arrive here, they're mentioned uh, that they come from one of the main pagan cities on the western shore of the Sea of Galilee. And you can see it here on the map. Tiberius is down there on the western side of the Sea of Galilee. Uh, the feeding of the 5,000 happens up here. These boats arrive from down here, and then they are going to cross over to Capernaum. This is actually just Tiberius on the hillside there at the Sea of Galilee, modern-day uh, Tiberius. And it was a pagan city uh, during the time of Christ. It was established by Herod Antipas. Um, he built it to honor um, the Caesar, or um, the Caesar and the ruler of Rome at the time, whose name was Tiberius. So that's why he calls it that. And the Jews didn't even like this city during the time of Christ because uh, when Herod Antipas built this city, he built it on top of a Jewish graveyard. Okay, now, when the crowd, though, realizes that their meal ticket has departed and their bellies are moaning for another meal, right? They went in search for Jesus. Again, why are we seeking Jesus? Do we just want Him for what He can do for us? Or is it love for Him alone? Is it love for Him alone that is our motivation? Or is it lust for what we want Him to do instead? It's a, it's a really important question. Now, they come ashore in Capernaum. Why would they bother to come ashore in Capernaum? Well, because Capernaum, if you look up uh, in Scripture, they call it the town of Jesus still today. Not that Jesus was... Uh, originally from Capernaum, but when Jesus sets up his public ministry for the three years he's here on the face of the earth, you can go look up the vast majority of all the miracles, uh, a bunch of the teaching that Jesus does, it happens right here in this town. This is the hub uh, for Jesus's public ministry. Now, 
I want to set the stage for this, the whole rest of this chapter, because the whole rest of this chapter happens in a specific location in this town, okay? And it tells us later on in the chapter uh, what that location is. But we need to understand that there's this discussion that's going to take place throughout the rest of the chapter. Jesus is going to be teaching. The people are going to be interrupting him. It's going to be, there's going to be a lot of interaction that takes place. And where does it take place? It takes place, we find out later on here in this chapter, it takes place in the synagogue in Capernaum. Now, again, this is the synagogue in Capernaum. This is not some place or uh, a possible place. This is the spot. Jesus stood right here in this area, right here, and spoke the vast majority of all that we're going to read here in the end of John chapter 6. And their seating, you can't see it in this particular photo here, but they're seating over here to the left where Danielle is seated with Haley, and then they're seating over here on the right also. And the rabbi would kind of walk around out here in the middle, which would have been Jesus at this point. He'd walk around out here in the middle. The people are sitting on the side, and the rabbi would make comments or make teachings, and the people in the midst of it all, if they didn't understand what the rabbi was saying or the teacher was saying, they'd say like, hey, wait a second. And they'd interrupt him in the middle of his teaching. There was a whole lot of give and take going on. Now, a service inside a synagogue in Jesus' day is a far cry from the church services that we design in America today. In most churches today, they hope to provide a polished performance up up front where nothing is required of those who listen other than to maybe respond to some appropriate uh, prompts, verbal prompts like, the Lord be with you. And then people would answer back, what? And also with you, right? I mean, that... That's the kind of participation maybe that happens. But for the most part, it's, it's all up front and, and everybody's just expected to sit there in silence. You just hear whatever it is and then you might get something, you might not. You walk out the door and adios. However, that's not what was happening in Jesus' day. I was thinking, I personally believe that we need way more participation within the body of Christ today. This whole idea of just show up and feed me and then I'll just leave fat and happy, that's really not all that biblical. It's been said that 20% of the people do the majority of the work in the church in America. Now, I would say, in some respects, that's probably um, a failure of leadership, an opportunity, and it's also uh, just not healthy to just show up and get fed and then never put anything into practice. What happens If all you do is eat and you never get rid of what you ate, what happens to you? You become what? Constipated. (laughs) Constipated, right? And the Bible does not encourage this idea of being a uh, constipated Christian. Okay, We don't need constipated Christians. We don't need people all inflow, no outflow. And Jesus, uh, as he leads them to the promised land, the Jews, when God designed the promised land, he designed it with that illustration in mind. The Sea of Galilee, the the Jordan River flows in from the top. It flows into the Sea of Galilee and it flows out of the Sea of Galilee. And the Sea of Galilee still today teems with life. All sorts of fishing that you can do out of the Sea of Galilee. It's, It's an incredible place. Same water flows all the way down here to the Dead Sea, the lowest place on the face of the earth. Exact same water. Enters into the Dead Sea. Does not leave the Dead Sea. And the Dead Sea is so dead, there's nothing living in it. Maybe a microorganism or two, and that's it. It's constipated. It's dead. And listen, as far as we're concerned, man, I really want to encourage you to be proactive in not just listening, but participating. And not just participating here, but participating out there. Because that's where it's needed the most. It's part of the reason why I enjoy having different people volunteer to read Scripture. Um, It's why the time I I take the time to ask questions. I'm not trying to ask questions to fool you or trick you or whatever. It's like the idea of like, let's participate. If we're in the middle of teaching, for me personally, I'm fine. Like, Like if you've got a question and you're like, you can put your hand up. I'll call on you if you got your question. And if 
I don't feel like it's appropriate to talk about right in the moment. We can say, well, let's talk about it afterwards. I don't care. I love that part when we do in Sunday school class that there's lots of discussion. There needs to be a lot of of discussion. That's uh, how things went in Jesus' day, and I think it's how it needs to be more in our day too. Okay, Verse 25. So they find Jesus. When they found him on the other side, they find him in Capernaum, and they said to him, Rabbi, teacher, because that's what's going on. They're standing inside the synagogue. They're seated in there. Jesus is in there. Rabbi, when did you come here? Now they address him as rabbi because the word rabbi means teacher. Why did they call him a teacher? Well, because just the day before, Jesus spent the majority of the day before he did the miracle with the food. He's teaching them. Okay? Jews were supposed to follow the teachings of their rabbi. Now, less than 24 hours before this conversation takes place, when Jesus finishes multiplying food out of thin air, the crowd is so excited about it, they want to do what with Jesus, if you remember? They want to make him king. They call him, oh, maybe this is the prophet. Let's make him king. Okay? Less than 24 hours. However, rather than answer their question, they ask a specific question. Rabbi, when did you come here? Rather than answer that question, Jesus chose to address the root motivations and the intentions instead. Jesus is always interested in addressing the issue of our heart. Because the Bible says, out of the heart flows what? It's it's the springs of life, right? It controls our outward behavior. Um, Somebody has Proverbs 4.23. It might be Charlotte, I think. Above all, guard your heart. Why? It's the wellspring of life. And Jesus here is going to address what's going on in their heart. Okay, verse 26. Jesus answered them. Remember, they said, Rabbi, when did you come here? This is Jesus' response to them. He doesn't even bother to answer it. He says, Truly, truly, I say to you, you're seeking me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. You're here asking me these questions. You're here interacting with me. Not because you care about me. Not because you believe what's going on. You just had a free meal and you liked it. As Jesus, as discussed in John chapter 5, the works of Jesus, when Jesus is speaking about witnesses that speak of him in John chapter 5, Jesus said um, that um, some of those witnesses that reveal his true identity as the Messiah, as God in the flesh, are his signs and his teachings. And they should have recognized from his signs and his teachings that Jesus was not some prophet or even the prophet. He was the Son of God. Now, coincidentally, this is exactly exactly what the disciples accurately realized after Jesus walked on water. When Jesus walks on water and he gets in the boat, Matthew says all the disciples worship Jesus in the boat and they correctly identify Jesus and they say, truly, truly, you are the Son of God. But for the crowd, they were just there for a free handout. Um, When we were down on family vacation, we stayed in Windsor, California uh, at a resort down there. And we were going in to uh, get some lunch uh, one of the last evenings we were there. And we pulled into this shopping center that's outside of a Walmart and some other places that are there. And there's multiple different strip malls in this uh, section that you're pulling into. We pull into the section as we're pulling in. There's a woman at the front who appeared to be, for all intents and purposes, 100% healthy. She was young. She was capable. Certainly capable of holding a sign up nice and high that said, anything helps. And then we pulled into the place where we were going, and literally every single 
door of all the stores that were in front of, including the restaurants, all had what in the window, you think? She didn't want a job. If she did, she could have had one. She wanted a free handout. Do for me. God, you do for me. Again, they didn't want Jesus. They just wanted Jesus to feed them for free and entertain them some. Do some miracles. Why are we following Jesus? Verse 27. Now Jesus says, he's going to address the issue of the miracle because they're off base. Speaks to them about food and he says, don't work for the food that perishes. That was yesterday. That's less than 12 hours ago. Okay? Don't work for food that perishes, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you, for on him God the Father has set his seal. Now, Jesus directed the people to himself instead of what he could temporarily do for them. The food the previous day had already perished, the crowd's hungry all over again. And instead, Jesus is wanting them to seek the eternal satisfaction that he offers through relationship with himself as the Son of Man. He's saying, hey, I'm here and I can give you lasting satisfaction, which he's going to get into. But the people, uh, they, they were off base. Now, I'll be a little candid with my own, my own life, my own story. Um, if anybody knows me, they know that I have the propensity to worry. I'm great at it. Unfortunately. Now, let me give you an example of how pathetic my own walk with the Lord is at times. And hopefully it speaks to you too. Now, currently in this season that we're in, Jesus has graciously answered the longings of our heart for a child in Daniel's womb. Seven years. We've been trying for that. He's provided a potential buyer for our house in Klam Falls, which we want to sell. He's provided uh, a potential home here in Malin. We'll see how it works out. He's provided money for Haley to have basically, if she works a little bit, have her whole college education paid for at a private Christian university. He's provided a Christ-loving spouse for our son, and another daughter for our family, and on and on and on. Now, do any of these things that are going on currently, currently in my life, stop me from wanting more? Or worrying about currently unmet wants or needs? No. The fact of the matter is, it doesn't matter how much the Lord does for me, my sinful nature always wants more. I always want more. Yes, He provided food miraculously yesterday, but what about today? That's pretty jacked up. That's real sinful. It's pathetic. But that's me. That's me outside of Jesus. And me. But when you're thinking about it in life in general, it's like, man, why, why am I following Jesus? Because the truth is, it doesn't matter how much Jesus does for me. It will never be enough. The moment something goes haywire, the moment something doesn't work exactly like I want it to work, I'm going to panic. I'll give you an example. We came home from family vacation. Had a lot of really good time alone with the Lord. Man, God spoke to me a ton while we were on family vacation. Come home from family vacation. And the next day, when we got home from family vacation, we rolled up to the house and the house was kind of warm. And I was like, oh, this isn't, this isn't normal because we had the AC set at a certain temperature for while we were gone. And I go into our bedroom and we're supposed to have an attic fan that works, you know, to help blow out some of the hot air out of the attic. And I'm like running with the switch and nothing's working. The attic fan is broken. So what do you think dominated my frame of thought for about the next 24 to 48 hours? An attic fan. 
I crawled up in there the next morning. I, I went and bought an attic fan and crawled up in there, switched it out. It was really hard to get to. So I'm like, oh, I hope this works because I don't want to crawl back up in there again. That was rough. It's dumb. <laughs> it's dumb, the stuff that will will forsake and frustrate or get worried about, right? It doesn't have to make sense. Jesus himself, when he was addressing the issue of our heart, he's constantly going after it. When Jesus is talking in an individual conversation with Nicodemus in John chapter 3, what is he speaking to Nicodemus about? Oh, he's speaking to him about the issue of his heart. When Jesus speaks to the woman at the well, he's speaking to her about the issues of her heart. When Jesus is speaking to the paralytic by the pool of Bethesda in John chapter 5, he's speaking to him about the issues of his heart. And now he's got a big crowd of people inside the synagogue in Capernaum, and Jesus is speaking to them about the issues of their heart. And Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 6, verse 19, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust do what? Destroy, or where thieves break in and steal. But, but instead, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy. Attic fans do not break. Thieves do not break in and steal. And then Jesus says, verse 21, for where your treasure is, where's my heart? There your heart will also be. There your heart will be also. What are you treasuring? Am I treasuring Jesus for being Jesus, for who He is in relationship with Him, regardless of what happens? Or do I really want Him, if I'm honest, to just be my bellhop? Do I just want him to be my contractor on call? Hey, this is broke. How soon can you get here? <laughs> now, verse 28. They said to him, Jesus just said, don't work for the food that perishes. That's what he said. Verse 28. They said to him, what must we do to be doing the works of God. All right, they're tracking with Jesus. Jesus says, don't work for food that perishes. So then they say, well, what must we do to be doing the works of God? Now, again, I love the interaction. This is Jesus teaching in the synagogue. He's saying a statement that people are like, hey, what about this? Jesus says a statement, hey, what about that? Right? They're not just sitting there. Previously, they heard Jesus address the idea of working for eternal food. So they naturally asked, what must be done to do the works of God? They were interested in what Jesus offered initially, not knowing what he was offering. But they were stuck in the same place that we all tend to get baffled. We're convinced that we need to do something. We're convinced of it. It's our default. Why? Well, because ultimately, if I have to do something for it, who gets to take credit? Me. I get the credit. It's a pride issue. Surely I need to do something extravagant. What must I do to do the works of God? Just lay it out for me, Jesus. Give me the five-point plan. You do this, 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 and this, and then you get this. Also, it's probable Jesus just got done telling them, saying, listen, if you uh, believe in me, you'll do the works of God. Okay? What work of God do you think they were interested in? Make bread. Yeah, what, what do I have to do to be able to generate bread out of thin air so I don't have to work for meals anymore and bake bread all day? Verse 29. Jesus answered them, and he's going to give them a straight answer this time. Jesus says, this is the work of God that you believe in him whom he sent. What's the work of God? What's the work of God that God wants you to do? It's really rough, by the way. It's so long, it's really difficult to understand. What is, what's the work of God that He wants you to do? Believe. Just believe in Jesus. Just believe in Jesus. That's it. Embrace Jesus alone for salvation. 
The work of God is just simply to believe in him whom he sent. That's simple faith. That's mere belief. We don't need to crawl on our bellies. We don't have to starve ourselves. We don't have to do a whole bunch of meditation. We just need to believe in Jesus for the forgiveness of our sin. Salvation in Jesus Christ is a free gift. It's just a matter of just take it. You just want it, you want it or not. Free gift. The work is simply to receive it. Verse 30 through 31. Now, this, these two verses, when every single time I read these two verses, they pop off the page to me and I just want to pull my hair out. Because it exposes just how ridiculous we are. Listen to, this is ridiculous. This is one of the most ridiculous statements in the entire Bible, in my personal opinion. They said to him, <clears throat> what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? Our fathers, this is, I mean, they pour it on. Our fathers ate manna, bread, in the wilderness, as it's written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. I looked it up in the Urban Dictionary. There's this word out there that people will say that something is redonkulous, right? That's like ridiculous, exponentially ridiculous. It's beyond ridiculous. It's redonkulous. This is redonkulous. This is stupid. But it's the perfect illustration of just how lost we truly are in Christ. They had the audacity to ask Jesus to give them a sign. Did they have amnesia? <laughs> Now, but it's worse than that. Less than 24 hours ago, Jesus created food for them out of thin air. Thanksgiving stuffed. Right, Thanksgiving stuffed. Now, but it gets worse. It gets worse. They say, they have the audacity to say, the sign they specifically requested so that they would believe. If you'll do this, Jesus, we'll believe. Jesus, if you would be willing to create bread from heaven for us to eat, we'll believe. Say what? They cite how God used Moses to provide manna or bread for Israel while wandering in the wilderness. Specifically, they're referencing here either two scriptures. Uh, one is Nehemiah 9.15. Could somebody read that one, whoever I gave that to? Yeah. I think it's Jonathan might have Psalm 78, 24 through 25. He rained down manna upon them to eat and gave them food from heaven. Man did eat the bread of angels. He sent them food in abundance. All right, this is what they're referencing. They're referencing what happened in the book of Exodus while the children of Israel are wandering in the wilderness. They've got nothing to eat. Nothing to eat. And what does God provide for them day in, day out, except for on the Sabbath where he provides a double portion the day before? What does he provide? Bread. Bread. They just wake up in the morning and God's been baking and during the night and he scatters it out on the ground around the camp. And it's a lot of bread because it's enough to feed two million plus people wandering in the desert. Take God does that for 40 years. They said, to Jesus, if you could just create bread out of thin air, we'll believe you. I mean, it's so shameful, it ought to just leave you a little bit speechless. I mean, you're just like, what? And especially the time frame, right? I mean, it hasn't even probably been 12 hours. But it doesn't matter how much the Lord does for us. We always want more. If our motivation for following Jesus is what he can do for us, it, he won't satisfy you because there's no satisfying your wants. There's no satisfying your desires. There's none satisfying mine either. If that's why you want to follow Jesus, you're looking in the wrong spot. Verse 32 through 33, Jesus said to them, First, maybe he went, I don't know, oy vey, you know, like, 
what is going on. Truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses that gave you bread from heaven, for my Father gives you true bread from heaven. It wasn't Moses who made the bread. And then Jesus says, verse 33, for the bread of heaven is he, is he. He who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. So Jesus drew their attention to the facts. Moses did not provide manna for them in the wilderness. God did. They were glorifying, instead of the Lord, they were glorifying the messenger, not the creator of life. And the manna was supposed to just be an example, a type of the very one who now stood in their midst. Only this manna, the manna Jesus is going to offer, does not fade again into hunger. Next, the bread of God. Notice, the bread of God is not an item, it's a person. Jesus says, the bread of heaven, verse 33, is He. Jesus used multiple object lessons to describe Himself to us. Uh, With the woman at the well, what does Jesus call Himself? He calls himself living water to quench spiritual thirst. Now with the crowd gathered at the synagogue in Capernaum, Jesus is heavenly bread that would satisfy their spiritual hunger and he provides everlasting life to all that would receive him in this world. Now, what Jesus offers us, (coughs) as nice as the bread of the month club would be, (laughs) Jesus offers us something way more significant than a membership to the Bread of the Month Club. Verse 34. They said to Jesus, Sir, give us this bread always. Now, they ask for this bread that Jesus has been speaking of. Uh, Hopefully this phrase, give us this bread always, sounds a little bit familiar to you in the Gospel of John because Jesus, when he's having a previous conversation with the woman at the well, he's talking to her about living water and what's her response? Sir, give me that water, right? Um, I have somebody who reads uh, John 4.15, please. All right. Now, first of all, is this woman's motive pure? She's wanting Jesus to do for her, right? She wanted the convenience of not having to draw water each day and endure the heat of the sun, the glares of all the people that hated her because of her reputation. But if you go back and you read, does Jesus give her the water anyway? Yes, he does. Okay. Now, we've already learned here that the crowd's motivations weren't any better than this woman. They were in interested in free meals from Jesus, not Jesus himself. However, there is one massive difference between these two. The woman at the well and this crowd here at Jesus' teaching. Their nationality. What's the woman at the well? She's a non-Jew. When Jesus was in Samaria with the woman at the well, did Jesus perform a single miracle? No, everybody believed just because of his teaching. He just had to tell them, and they accepted it. He performed no signs. He just spoke truth, and they believed. Here Jesus is speaking with his own people, the Jews, people who were fluent in his word. They were fluent with the promises of God. He taught them. He worked miracles for them huge one just less than 12, 24 hours before, but they remain hard-hearted and unwilling to believe. I do like one thing they say, though. They say, give. Give me this bread. And listen, if you're going to receive Jesus, He's a free gift. It is given. However, in their case, they're hoping um, so that they can have more free stuff. Do you want an intimate connection with the Lord, or you just want what God can do for you? 
Verse 35. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. Whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Now, this is the first of eight uh, different times in Scripture where Jesus made I am statements in the Gospel of John. I am meaning being reference to how God revealed himself to Moses in the burning bush, right? I am the bread of life here in chapter 6. I'm light of the world, chapter 8. I am, where Jesus just straight up says it. I am the door, chapter 10. I am the good shepherd, chapter 10. I am the way, the truth, the life. I am the true vine. And I am the resurrection and the life. And in each one of these statements, Jesus is claiming to be God in the flesh. He just proved it the night before with the disciples, right? The very presence of God, the very presence of the God who spoke to Moses from the burning bush in, the, in Exodus chapter 3 has provided bread for Israel, while, who provided bread for Israel while they journeyed through the wilderness, currently, for them, stood in their midst, inside the synagogue in Capernaum. He's walking around inside there teaching them. Now think about it for a moment. They were willing to accept that God could inhabit a bush, and speak. But they were unwilling to accept that God could dwell inside a human skin and speak to them in that very moment. It's also interesting to evaluate the difference between Moses. They're citing Moses, right? Like they're following Moses, which they're not. They're, the difference between Moses and Israel, who Moses led. Throughout the wilderness, Moses drew near to the Lord. And by abiding in God's presence, Moses was completely satisfied. Not just physically, but spiritually. In fact, his time in God's presence was so rich, so satisfying, that Moses' face uh, would shine with God's glory uh, afterwards. In Exodus 34, 29, it says, When Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the testimony, the Ten Commandments, in his hand as he came down from the mountain, Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because he had been talking with God. Moses understood the value of the Lord. And he enjoyed time in the presence of the Lord for the Lord's sake. The children of Israel... And it's, what have you done for me this morning? Okay? That's where it's going on. They were, this crowd that's there with Jesus is just like Israel in the wilderness. God performed a miracle for them, and they were thankful in the moment. Right in the moment, they were thankful until the next need arose. And then they complained and they grumbled all over again. It's just like the feeding of the 5,000. The meals only touched their stomachs, but not their soul. Next, notice how Jesus offered himself as bread of life. But not just bread of life, but he also says as living water, right? Whoever comes to me will never hunger. He who believes in me will never, what? Thirst, Thirst right? He's saying, oh, I'm better than even just bread. I'm bread and water. As we journey throughout this uh, section in Scripture, we're going to find why Jesus adds water to this equation. It's a symbol, first of all, of His flesh. That's bread. And blood, water, shed for us so that we might have eternal life. Listen, the truth is this. Jesus is the bread of life. You want life? You can have it. Where do you get it? Jesus. Jesus is living water. Want life? Where do you find it? You find it in Jesus. Now, Jesus said, if you want to receive this bread, back here uh, in the previous verse, verse 35, he said, first you must come. You must come to him. Scripture says in John or James chapter 4, verse 8, draw near to God and God will do what? He'll draw near to you. Come, Jesus says, draw near. And if you want to drink deeply of his living water, he says, then you must believe. You must believe in Jesus. The word believe means to place your full trust in Him. In, uh, I asked somebody for Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6.
that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. All right, we have these same two words right here in this verse. Um, Without faith, it's impossible to please him. The one who comes to God, come, must believe that he exists, that he proves to be the one who rewards those who seek him. I was thinking about it. It's like visiting the doctor, right? If I recognize that I'm ill, I'm sick, and I need help, I first need to know who the physician is who can help, and then I have to come to him, right? And believe in his ability before I can receive whatever curative care Lord willing, that he provides. And with the Lord, it's like, are we willing to recognize that we're sick? If so, he's saying, come, believe, receive. Finally, notice how Jesus said, if you come to him, you'll never hunger and you'll never thirst. Now, does this mean that a Christian, a a person who's placed their faith in Christ, is never hungry or thirsty? Absolutely not. I carry a water bottle with me just about everywhere I go. I don't even like to leave home without having a water bottle. I like to have something to drink, and I like to have it handy right by me. I get thirsty a lot. I don't even like to feel thirsty. That's why I bring a water bottle with me pretty much everywhere I go. Now, Jesus is certainly here not speaking of physical hunger or thirst. Clearly. He's addressing internal spiritual issues. Remember, Jesus is the bread of life. Jesus is living water. And in regard to spiritual satisfaction, in regard to spiritual satisfaction, Jesus is 100% accurate. He's totally satisfying. Every single time I simply come to him and believe in him and spend time with him, every single time I find deep contentment. I find satisfaction. Every single time I find myself to be spiritually hungry or spiritually thirsty, it isn't because Jesus is unwilling or unable to help me. Rather, it's I simply haven't made the choice to come, to believe, to abide in his presence and receive. If you're here today and you're spiritually hungry or thirsty, it's not because Jesus doesn't satisfy. It's because you're not rolling up to the meal where he's waiting. He always satisfies. Verse 36. Jesus said, but I said to you that you have seen me and yet you don't believe. So the purpose of the miracle of the bread the day before, the feeding of the 5,000, was to prepare the way for them to understand that Jesus was the bread of life and he was able to supply internal, eternal contentment. They saw Jesus perform a miracle with their physical eyes, but their spiritual eyes were what? Blind. Blind. Bad. Totally blind. Jesus didn't have to perform a single miracle for the Samaritan woman or the people in the town of Samaria to believe. He simply told them the truth and they responded by faith. Here the Jews not only heard Jesus speak the truth, but they were eyewitnesses to one of the greatest miracles ever performed in the history of humanity. But they don't what? They don't believe. It got me thinking as we close today, what's it going to take for you to believe? Will you remain hard-hearted and arrogant and demand God to jump through a series of hoops that you require for Him like some good little lap dog or a trained monkey? Or will you simply surrender and receive Him for the abundant goodness that He longs to provide? The evidence to prove Scripture is overwhelming. If you need to understand the facts before you'll believe, then you can get busy searching them out. They're easily attainable. They're easily uh, accessible. But like Paul, uh, when he's, or Saul, before he becomes Paul, when he's uh, going the wrong direction, God intervenes in his life and he asks Saul at the time, stop kicking against the goads. 
A goat is a cattle prod, right? He's saying, listen, why are you, why are you being such a nutcase? Knock it off. There's nothing. Again, we referenced it last week. But the Rolling Stones were 100% accurate, at least with the one line in their song. And it's true. I can't get no satisfaction. I can't get no satisfaction outside of Jesus. That's the truth. You can look for it. You'll never find it. You can go out there and you can try and you can waste all that time. You can waste all that energy. You can go out there and you can make all those mistakes, uh, which in the end of the day, after you make that mistake, you're going to be looking back and you're going to be like, what am I doing? The, the, the things I'm now ashamed of. Right? I don't look back on my life and see any of the things that I've done outside of God. I don't have a single one of those things that I look back on my life that I see that I've done outside of God and think to myself, man, that was good. I don't even have a thing to point to in reference and say that worked out good. When I think about the things that I've done in my life that are apart from the Lord, I look back and all I have is regret. Conversely, on the flip side, every time I've spent time alone in the Lord's presence, walked with the Lord, whatever, done things as he's asked me to do, I don't have a single one that I regret, not one. In fact, oftentimes when I leave that kind of time, when I've had that kind of time with the Lord and I leave that kind of time, man, I'm like, whoa, I wish it didn't have to end. I wish I didn't have to stop. No shame, no condemnation, no regret. Instead, it's like blessing, goodness, favor, joy, peace, satisfaction. We don't have to live like the Rolling Stones. That's stupid. (laughs) They wasted, I mean, I don't know where they're at with Jesus now, but they certainly wasted their whole adult lives. Jesus provides lasting satisfaction. He is the bread of life and he's offering it right now. And tomorrow morning when you wake up, he's offering it right now. Tonight when you go to sleep, right now. Anytime, anywhere, just roll up. You don't have to wait around like we just had the the fair comes around once a year. Right? You don't have to wait around for the fair. Uh, You don't even have to wait around like they used to have to do in the Old Testament. Once a year, they had the Day of Atonement, right? And just one guy on the face of the earth, one guy only, was allowed to go inside God's, uh, into the presence of the Lord one day a year, one guy only, and he, they had to lead in there with a rope in case he kicked the bucket so they could drag him out because he got struck dead. You and I have access to God any time we want it. Wow. Anytime I want it, anytime. Jesus is the bread of life. Father, Lord, thank you for the opportunity to spend some time uh, in your presence today. And Lord, to be honest, I just pray, God, that that's all we would be thankful for right now. Lord, not what you can do, but Lord, who you are. God, thank you for the opportunity to spend some time in your presence. And just like it always is, it's time well spent. You're the bread of life. You're living water. And in you, Jesus, because of you, we are totally satisfied. 
And Lord, I pray that by the power of your Holy Spirit, you would continue out of your love for us, God, to expose the root motivations in our heart. And Lord, if they're off track, out of love, reveal them to us. So that we can see them for what they are. Just like I see my worry and how stupid it is. And then, Lord, by the power of your Holy Spirit, just start delivering us from our nonsense. So that we can walk more closely with you and live a life that's less stressed. More peace, less stress. (laughs) You're the bread of life. Help us just simply feast on you day in, day out. It's in Jesus' mighty name that we pray. Amen. Thank you for your time. You're dismissed.